Welcome to Mentoring Moments. Mentoring Moments is a sub-series of the E-Commerce Edge podcast. It is composed of clips taken from Jason's one-to-one and group mentorship sessions. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the podcast. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome Michael Kaufman from Pro Tough Products. Welcome, Michael. Hey, thank you. Glad to be here. It's awesome to have you here. We were speaking about off air just before we kicked things off that you guys are just about ready to make the big move to Puerto Rico from the U.S. So this is a as someone who moved to Mexico in March of 2023. I know what it's like to make a pretty significant move to another country. And I'd lived in New Zealand prior to that for almost 30 years and moved there from the state. So I know what that feels like. And it's an exciting prospect, but there's always challenges that go along with that. So I, I'm guessing you're both excited and thinking, wow, this is something very different to maybe what I would normally do. Yeah, for sure. It's interesting. I've lived in Michigan all my life. This is a pretty big change for me in just about every way imaginable. The weather, the people, the everything is going to be different. And my wife and I, we've got four kids who are basically just out of college and up who all will be staying here. And so it'll be our first opportunity at being empty nesters. And so it's it's an interesting prospect. Definitely looking forward to it, but very anxious about what that actually looks like. As someone who has now lived in two countries that they were not born and raised in, I can tell you that it, it is both super exciting, but also equally challenging. And I think that challenge is how we grow. And the reality is when we get outside of our comfort zones, comfort zones feel great, but not a lot grows there. And so the reality is when we get outside our comfort zones, we're challenged in ways we could never possibly imagine, especially when we move to a country where maybe English isn't the most common language and another language is. And especially when cultures and traditions and foods and all those things are different, when the weather's different. Although I can definitely say that you're, uh, from a weather perspective, you're moving up in the ranks of, of good weather and it'll be a little bit more comfortable for you to adapt to. You'll probably go from in wintertime wearing coats, jackets, and five layers to, to being in tank tops and, and shorts and, and sandals. You probably aren't doing too bad there, but I wish you every success. And I'm really looking forward to hearing how that all goes for you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, we're looking forward to it as well. Uh, hopefully I'll get out and get a lot of pickleball play in the winter here where I don't, no, I don't back home. So, <laughs> Absolutely love it. Pickleball's taken off around the world as well. But I guess this is a great segue into what we want to talk about today. And you're, uh, you've so graciously agreed to come on the pod as a guest mentor talking about all things Amazon and merchant success on Amazon because you have built a very successful greater than seven figure big business on Amazon, all based on a very limited subset of products, but doing those products very well with a service that is pretty much unmatched in the industry. But before we get into that, what I love about what you have done is that you haven't relied on direct to consumer, which everybody says you got to do direct to consumer. You can't sell via marketplaces only and be successful and make a living at it, which you've shattered that myth. And then secondarily, you've been able to turn this business into one where you can be a digital nomad and you can move countries. So you're not tied down. You're not shackled to one place. So you've put a lot of maybe myths to rest about what you can do as a digital nomad or what you can do as an online business owner, as a pure play online business owner. And I think this is going to resonate with a tremendous amount of my audience who are perhaps in their day job today, and they're thinking, hey, maybe I'd like to build a side hu hustle selling a few things on Amazon. Maybe they think, oh, this is easy. I can set up a drop shipping business and never have to see or touch my products and be responsible for them. They set up, they, they think, cool, I'll just set up a Shopify website. I'll put five products on there from maybe AliExpress, and maybe I'll do the drop ship method and just send the orders off to the manufacturers. But that opportunity, at least from my perspective and what I'm seeing, if I look at Reddit every day and I see how many people have tried this and failed, it, you usually see 20, 10 to 20 posts a day of people who have set up a Shopify store. They've gotten a couple of products listed. They've spent maybe $5,000 on meta ads and haven't made a single sale yet. And they go, what, what am I doing wrong? And it feels like what you have built is vastly more sustainable than that. And you have backed all of your products up with a lifetime warranty that you service directly yourself without them having to go back to manufacturers and deal with the third parties or anything like that. You back that yourself. And it feels like you've, in a way, almost broken all the rules that people would say, you can't be successful doing this. You can't be successful with a small catalog. You can't be successful selling on Amazon only. You have to go direct to consumer. So maybe tell me even uh, how did you think in the beginning, I can do this. I can build a business this way and I can make a living off this. 
But it's interesting because when I first started, so I've been on Amazon for going on 10 years, and but I've been e-commerce for about 30 years. I originally started right, I was in college still actually when I started online and I was selling products from a multi-level company. And I sold those for, technically I still sell them, although I don't really do anything with it, but I sold those for 20 years, all online. I didn't do anything else. And, and back then, I was one of very few individuals that were doing it that way, but it worked out very well. So the problem was I was getting to a point where I wasn't entirely comfortable about the direction of the company whose products I was selling. I didn't like having all my eggs in that basket. I wanted to all along, they were saying, hey, hey, it's have your own business, whatever. You can have your own business. But ultimately, you don't really like they're still in control of your checks. They're still in control of a lot of things. I didn't like that. And so I decided to go a different direction. I wanted to at least have something else that, that I could rely on. And so I tested a lot of things. I did the Teespring thing for a while, selling t-shirts, did okay with that. It wasn't amazing, but I did pretty well. I, I had sold a book online that, that did pretty well. I wasn't going to be a millionaire or anything, but it worked. I was profitable. But at the end of the day, I knew I needed something more because at that point, I didn't have anything that was going to replace that income. And that's when, I don't know how many of your listeners would know it, but that's when Amazing Selling Machine came along. And so they were like the intro to, to private label sales on Amazon. They did a little four-part webinar series and it was free. So I thought, well, I'll check it out. I'm looking for ideas. Maybe this is something. And I got to the end of the four part series and they gave their pitch and said, Hey, for another 3,500 bucks, we'll teach you all of the ins and outs. And I said, I've been online long enough. I think maybe you taught me enough. You know, let's just give it a shot. I'm not going to pay the 3,500. I'll just try it on my own. It really wasn't, it was one of those things where I didn't know it was going to happen, but at the time it was a very low investment, you know, opportunity because I essentially just went looking for, okay, what product do I think I could enter in on a category that there's not a lot of competition in and go looking for a manufacturer on Alibaba, just like everybody else did. And I found pool rakes, pool nets, thought like, let's try it. So I ordered a case and I sent them into Amazon and a week later they were gone. And I thought, well, geez, that was awful easy. So I bought four cases and I sent those in and a couple of weeks later, those were gone and the rest is kind of history. But back then it was wild west. Back then, there weren't that many people on Amazon, relatively speaking, compared to now. Most of the people that were on Amazon had no idea what they were doing. So if you knew even a little bit about what you were doing from an e-commerce perspective, you could apply those same, many of those same business principles and be way ahead of the game, ahead of a lot of people. And so it was easy money back then. You know, it was really almost just put money in and you put a dollar in, you get $10 out kind of a thing. It was that easy. It's definitely not that now. It's way more complex than that. There's a lot more sellers that know what they're doing. There's a large number of Chinese sellers that are moving into the platform that absolutely know what they're doing and are way more ruthless than anybody in the U.S. is ever going to be. So I would never say that selling on Amazon right now is easy. It, it's by far not. To some degree, we were lucky that we got in when we did. It gave us a good foundation on which to build off of. If you were going to start now, I definitely think you're in a position where you better have some sort of mentorship in that process if you want to make it anything more than a hobby. I think you could do a hobby business on Amazon right now without too much trouble because you could do arbitrage. Arbitrage is still not that terribly difficult if you know the ins and outs of it, but it's difficult to grow that all that far without too much manual labor on your own part. Private label is really where you need to be if you want to have any significant income and not have it all be your own labor. But if you wanted a hobby a business where you can generate some decent money without a lot of hours, arbitrage is still a pretty easy way to do that. Going out to your local shops, buying a product low, selling it high on Amazon, that still works. It's a lot of people still do that. But if you want a significant business, private label is definitely where you got to be. And that's way harder now than it used to be. And for the benefit of the audience that may not know what private label means, I'll let you explain it in your own words and, and how you've built that. But as I understand it, that we would typically refer to that as either white labeling, whether that be an existing manufacturer of the products that we want to sell. Maybe we make some design tweaks to it or whatever, but ultimately they slap our brand on their product and it becomes almost like a proprietary brand that we're selling. So we're not just selling somebody else's stuff B2C, but we're doing D2C, direct to consumer of our own branded products. And in some cases, maybe we will have designed those products from the ground up and have a contract manufacturer making those, and that will be our private label, pro label product. Or as I said, maybe someone has something out there that you say, hey, man, this product is good enough 
that I'm actually, and I've tested maybe three or four, four or five suppliers of these products. I found the one that I think is the absolute best industry leader, and I'm going to hitch you know, their wagon to my horse. And what we're going to do is we're going to let them put my brand, my label that I can stand behind on their products, and they're going to continue to do product development independent of me. And then I'm going to sell those products under my own brand that then I have to support. I'm the seller of record. I'm the person that's, that supplies the warranty service, the replacements, the store credits, all those things. And my customers, if they have a problem with my product, they're going to return it to me. They're not going to return it to the manufacturer, say, in China or Vietnam or wherever they happen to be. They're going to return it to me, and I'm going to have to replace that product, et cetera. And so it feels like when you're brand building, you can either start from scratch and do everything yourself, or you can say, look, I'm going to do effectively the curation of products that I am prepared to sell underneath my own brand name and put and stand behind. Yeah, I think there's really not a whole lot that I would add to that. Honestly, I think it's a very good description of private label. It's really the, the next iteration of white labeling. White labeling, essentially, hey, I'm going to go find a manufacturer product and I'm going to sell it in a white box. Basically, I'm just not going to have their brand on it. They're going to produce it without their brand name. Private labeling just says, okay, I'm going to take that one step further. I'm going to take their product, but now I'm going to put my name on it. And I'm going to stand behind it. So I am the brand of record that anybody's going to come to if they need service or they need help. I'm the, the buck stops with me. And so I think that's a good description. I think that it's definitely a scenario where there's different gradations of what that looks like, for sure. Uh, as you said, you have the situation where you basically take the product as is and you put your, your brand name on it. And hopefully you have tested, like you said, multiple versions of that product, maybe from different manufacturers, whatever you found, what you think is the best, but you haven't really added anything or taken anything away from it. You basically said, look, I, your product from this manufacturer, I like yours the best. I want you to make it for me, slap my label on it, and I'm going to put my name behind it. And then you have that next iteration where you basically just say to the manufacturer, Hey, I like that product, but. There's a few things that I think customers would like a little better. I'd like you to use a more durable material here. I'd like you to add this feature. I'd like you to improve on this feature, those sort of things. And so as a rule, that's like that next step up. And then of course, obviously you have the stage where now you're in actual product development. And so you can do that one of two ways. You can either tell the manufacturer, I want a new product and these are the features that I'm looking for. And this is what I want it to accomplish. This is who I'm making it for. This is how durable I want it. Those sort of things. And they do the entire design on, on their, on their platform, or you can do your own design, hire a designer, work through the details of that. And then you can work with the manufacturer for them to produce that and create the molds. And then they're going to produce it. Or you could take it one more step and you could be the manufacturer, which I'm not going to do. So there's many levels of that. And a lot of that, honestly, I think is every, anything that you're doing in business, there's always that, that aspect of how many hoops am I willing to jump through that other people are not willing to jump through but that, that create a moat around my business and around my brand. Because let's say if I'm selling on Amazon and I go to a manufacturer and I say, yeah, I like that product, make that for me, put my brand name on it. I'm going to sell that. Then the only differentiator that I have is my price point potentially and the service level that I'm willing to place behind that. So maybe the warranty that I'm willing to give, how much service, how long is my guarantee, my refund policy, those sorts of things. That's really the only differentiator I have. I can market it with different, but that's just market. There's really no, there's no, no substance behind that. And so there's not really a very large moat around your product. And of course, on a marketplace situation like Amazon, all of your competitors are right there. It's not like selling on Shopify where when they come to your store, they're in your store, your shop, like it's only your products that are sitting there. There may be other products on the market, but they're not sitting right there on the shelf next to yours. Whereas on Amazon, it's a very different animal. And so product differentiation, even though I think that's always a good idea, no matter what you're selling, quite frankly, but if you're on Amazon, you better be differentiating in some significant way. And the more hoops that you're willing to jump through, the better. So if you don't have that moat, you have a problem on Amazon, for sure, I guess is the only point that I'm making. Some of those moats that you can create would be an exceptional warranty, changing the product in some significant way that is maybe patentable, having your old molds with the manufacturer so that technically they should not be using your molds to manufacture for somebody else. If you're manufacturing in China, of course, you can't guarantee that, but I would say build your brand into the mold 
So have it imprinted directly in the mold. That's helpful. That makes it harder on them. Jumping through certification hoops, whether that's EPA type certifications or things like that. A lot of sellers aren't willing to do that. So again, on Amazon, any of those moats that you can put around your business is, is going to be a big benefit. And it feels like maybe the sweet spot in that range going all the way from, hey, I'm just grabbing a white box from somebody and maybe even putting my own sticker on it before it goes out. And that's as far as it goes to, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to take someone who I trust and, and builds a great product that I want to be aligned with and get them to put my brand on that product versus the next step, which is tweaking it slightly and modifying it, maybe having some better ingredients or some better components or whatever it might be. And then all the way through to complete ground up, you design, they build for you manufacturing, or you tell them an idea and they design it and, and build it for you. It feels like maybe the sweet spot in terms of return on investment, at least when you're starting out, might be tweaking an existing product. It, it, it's, it's relatively low additional investment for something that instantly goes from anyone can sell it to something that's more defensible in terms of even just from a marketing perspective, you now are not having to lie or you're not having to embellish uh, to, to try to differentiate your product from someone else. You actually genuinely yeah. do have a differentiator that is worthy of putting some marketing behind and some messaging and your brand behind. So it feels like, especially for someone starting out, maybe that's the, the sweet spot in the middle that isn't going to cost you the earth, but is going to help build something defensible into your business, some kind of a moat. Yeah, I would say that's a very accurate uh, perception. It's And probably the simplest version of that is durability. A lot of products are just not very durable. So in other words, if it's say an injection molded type product or something, which of course a lot of them are, you can just simply change the material that's being injected. Maybe you could do a carbon fiber impregnated material or something like that. I would say twofold is where you benefit there because one, you can actually build more durability into that. Maybe threefold. You can build more durability, which obviously is going to get better reviews. You can offer a better warranty or a warranty at all, because a lot of products don't offer a warranty, but certainly you could improve on that if you can make the product more durable. And then thirdly, you have the marketing side of it, which is thinking through the question of what are the materials that I could have them use that they don't have to change the mold. They can use the exact same mold. We're just going to change what we're injecting into the mold, but that it's materials that I can market in such a way that makes it sound as good or even better than it really is. So for instance, a lot of people understand that carbon fiber is the cat's meow. In reality, it's not the best thing for everything, but everybody seems to think that it is. So if you can design a product and you can use carbon fiber, which costs a little bit more, but even if it, if it, it doesn't have to be completely carbon fiber, if it's just carbon fiber impregnated nylon or something, it's still stronger, but you can say carbon fiber, and everybody's ears prick up like, oh, wow, it's carbon fiber. That, that must be amazing. And hopefully it is actually better. It should be better. But they think it's even better maybe than it is. From a marketing perspective, that's helpful. So thinking through that in terms of, okay, I can improve on the durability if I change the material. And if I use this particular material, I can market it better than if I use this other one that might be just as strong, but nobody knows what it is. And now let's talk about how you think about selling on Amazon from a logistics perspective, right? I see there's multiple variations of this floating around online. And I, some of it is a little bit of a carryover from the D2C world. And then they come into marketplace land and they carry those concepts over. Sometimes they'll have their own 3PL where those products that have your brand on them are sent from say China to the United States to your own warehouse that's housed with a third party logistics provider or perhaps your own warehouse that you own and operate your own warehouse with your own WMS system, et cetera, or that inventory is shipped directly to Amazon so that it can be shipped out via FBA, fulfilled by Amazon. And so there's different variations on this. And even so far as when some brands start out, it, they are very clear on the Amazon website because Amazon requires you to be clear that it's going to be shipped from overseas, meaning, okay, my factory's in China, they're going to ship every individual order directly to my customer. And that might take a week per shipment, but as long as I'm transparent and honest about that on Amazon, Amazon isn't going to ping me. So long as I hit the targets that I've said, I will hit for my customers in the target destination, right? right? So it feels like there are multiple ways someone could go when they first start out with this. And they're probably not going to start out by ordering the, the MOQ of the manufacturer, which in some instances might be a thousand pieces or 500 pieces, have it shipped to their own warehouse and set it up when their startup business I see usually the variation is have it shipped to Amazon, they ship it for you, 
or they have it shipped directly from the manufacturer to the customer. And that's where they start, even if that's not where they end. Yeah, um, those would definitely be the, the two ends of the spectrum that are probably most common, for sure. There, there are some uh, fulfillment companies that are coming on the scene that will fulfill. So you're not fulfilling from the manufacturer, but you are potentially still fulfilling from China, like Portless or something like that. Uh, yep. And those are direct to consumer. Those are good services. They have some monthly minimums. So you'd have to pay attention to how many units do you think you're going to be able to run through and, and be reasonably conservative on that number. But if you think you can hit their MLQs, then that works. I, for myself, what I would say is this. So I would run it similarly to what I did from the very beginning. And that is when I first started out, I didn't order large quantities, but I also did still have them shipped from Amazon. Now, the issue is that there's multiple touch points and that the expense goes up because first they're shipping it to you and they're shipping it in a smaller quantity. So it's probably coming by air. You could do a less than container load of thing by sea, but it takes a while. If you want to test quickly by air is going to make sense. So I ordered a case by air. It cost me a fortune. It wasn't cheap. I didn't make any money on those first rakes, but by the same token, it's only a case. By the unit, I paid a bundle, but I didn't pay thousands of dollars for that shipment. And it gave me a, a short little test study. What I would say is shipping on your own or using an alternative shipping option that is, let's say, slow by comparison to Amazon. And let's face it, most options in comparison to Amazon are slow. You put yourself at a disadvantage. And in, in, in a sense, you cloud the data is, I guess, the best way that I could put it. Because if you try and start out selling on Amazon and you're shipping what is called FBM, fulfilled by merchant, which basically just means you have figured out some other fulfillment method besides Amazon warehouse fulfillment, and the shipping times are longer, Amazon already is going to ding you in terms of your search placement, in terms of your likelihood to show up in the buy box, whatever. So let's say that you are going private label. And so therefore you are the only seller on your listing. So understand that on Amazon, you have a couple of different ways that, that this works. You can sell a product that already exists on the web, on the, on Amazon, and you can just become another seller. So there could be 30 sellers on one listing for the same product. That's essentially a wholesale model. You can also do that with the retail arbitrage thing. You're just one of a bunch of sellers on the very same listing, same product. Alternatively, there are multiple products in the same product category. You are one of them and you're the only seller on that listing. That's a private label scenario where you're the only one. Everybody else is selling on a different listing. They also up in the search results, but if they click on yours from the search results, it's just you. In that scenario, if somebody, let's say, let's take our product line, pool pulls, okay? If somebody searches for pull, then there's a bunch of listings that show up. Prota products, lifetime guaranteed pull shows up as one of the listings. If I'm selling or, or I'm shipping uh, by some alternative method besides FBA, then the likelihood is I am going to get beat out in the search results by every other seller that can get it to them faster than me. All other things equal, let's say, right? If my review profile is similar, if, if my price point is similar, if all of the other major things that Amazon uses ag algorithmically to rank people are the same, but my shipping time is a day or two later or five days later, like everybody's going to be ahead of me. And so you're not going to get much exposure. So the only way you get any exposure, of course, is by ads. And that also means you have to pay more for the ad because again, same thing. Amazon would rather... Amazon customers are expecting short shipping times. So from a click-through uh, rate and a conversion rate perspective, Amazon knows if you're advertising your product and they show yours there versus some other product that would have shipped two days sooner, you're going to get lower click-through and lower conversion rate, which makes Amazon less money, okay? So that's, I guess, my recommendation. If, if you decide to sell on Amazon, don't cloud your data by starting out in a scenario where you're shipping with long shipping times because already your data is screwed. You don't actually know how many units you could sell, how quickly you could sell, at what price you could sell because Amazon's not giving you the exposure that you could have if you were using Amazon FBA and shipping from their warehouses.
Hey team, I have a big favor to ask you. Please pause this episode and send the link of this episode to someone you know that you think would enjoy this content. Really appreciate you spreading the word. This is how we grow. We're not a Joe Rogan. We don't have big, massive advertising budgets, but we absolutely want to grow. We want to get the learnings from all of these episodes out to as wide of an audience as possible, and we need your help to do it. Thank you, and now back to your listening. Makes complete sense. And then I guess also it potentially, even if you've been clear about your shipping times, not only is your conversion rate going to be lower, not only are you not going to ever own the buy box, not, not only is Amazon effectively going to penalize you in terms of your rankings, whether it be in your category or in the specific product that you're selling, but also customer feedback matters. And even if you're clear as day that this is going to take two weeks to get to you, when it takes two weeks to get to the customer, then sometimes they're going to complain and they say, it took two weeks to get to me. And sometimes you don't have a tremendous amount of control about the type of feedback that you're getting. So as part of the, the Amazon algorithm, as I understand it, they're going to be looking at things like price, things like shipping times, things like availability, things like – but reviews play a massive part in that algorithmic listing and where you place and how much you have to pay when you go down the route of paid listings. And so it feels like to me that if a merchant was really going to pay attention to the thing they should be the most fearful of if they start to list on Amazon, it is how quick can they get their goods to their customers' hands. And if they, if they want to set themselves up for success – they should probably be prepared to spend a little bit more money to have everything done FBA, at least at the start, because you're stacking the deck in your favor at least as best as you possibly can. And you should probably wait to start listing your products until after the products have actually been received by Amazon to start shipping, as opposed to saying, hey, this is going to drop on X days or this date or whatever. And it feels like that is going to give you the best opportunity to get a good start because it feels, and at least anecdotally I hear, that if you start out your brand on Amazon and you start getting a few bad reviews from the start, shipping takes longer than expected right from the start. And you just – basically, if you don't start out clean, it is almost impossible to recover from on Amazon to the point where you might have to start up a whole new seller account under a whole new brand to recover. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's 100% it's true. Your launch of your brand and or product, if they're synonymous, is absolutely critical. Relaunching is very difficult. It's not impossible, but it is difficult. You, but essentially to relaunch, most of the time you have to start a brand new product and just throw the other one away. And if your brand launches poorly with feedback, so feedback is attached to your brand. Product reviews, of course, are attached to a product, but you have both. And Amazon is paying attention to both of those in terms of algorithmically how they're going to rank you. They're both part of that algorithm. So if you screw it up, then it is much harder to fix than to just start fresh. So yeah, you absolutely want to start out on the best foot and using FBA is the way to do that for sure. It gets you the fastest shipping times. And I'll give you, here's, a, here's an absolutely true thing that you can even look up for if you're not even on Amazon and you want to prove this to yourself. Use any product and say, find that press. So let's say PoolNet. We'll just stick with our product line. So you search for PoolNet. Now, go look for our products, and this is something that we're actually working on right now. It's a brand new initiative with our brand that we're working on that I think is actually going to have a massive effect on our sales that we didn't even know it's a thing. I literally didn't even know it was a thing. Go search for our, open an incognito window so Amazon doesn't know where you are, right? And so what you're going to do is search for PoolNet or whatever product you want, but let's say it's PoolNet. And find a particular product. So let's say you look for ours. So you're looking for the ProTuff PoolNet. You find us, mark what position we are. Ignore the sponsored listing. So if it says sponsored, ignore that and count out how many listings down that product is, okay? And in whatever zip code you're in, let's say you're where I am, 49331, we're number 10, whatever it is. Now, change the zip code and put in 90210, Beverly Hills, right? Do another search for the very same keyword. Look for the very same product. You will find the ranking will be different. And oftentimes drastically different. Like you might be fifth in one market, in one zip code. You might be literally 50th in another zip code. Now, if you look at all the products that come ahead of you in that list, in almost all cases, and again, eliminate the sponsored listings, only pay attention to the organic listings. Again, all things considered, the products that rank ahead of you, many of them, if not most of them, will be products that ship faster than yours. 
And even if you're using FBA, this can still be a thing because Amazon decides where to distribute your product. So if Amazon has not distributed your product to a warehouse that's relatively close to that zip code, then your shipping time to that zip code will be longer than other products that have been placed in warehouses near that zip code. So this is called geo ranking, and it's a totally brand new thing. Talk to an Amazon seller. One will say it doesn't happen. One will say that it does happen, but you can't do anything about it. And another who's the smartest of the three recognizes not only does it happen, but there is there are things that you can do about it. But in the beginning, the simplest thing is just to recognize that the reason that's a thing is because is partly because shipping times matter. Shipping times are really important. So making sure that you're in FBA and you're getting that close to shipping time is really critical. And as I understand it, and I'd love your validation on this, as I understand it, the way that you can game FBA, or there's no such thing as gaming FBA, but the best way that you can stack the deck in your favor is to ship to FBA, wherever that receipting warehouse is for you, that you ship them enough product and they can hold enough inventory that they can actually spread that to one more than one FBA warehousing location. Whereas obviously in your case, if you're sending, sending them only one case, they're not going to do that. They're not going to, they're not going to spread it around geographical warehouses. They're not going to put some on the East coast and some on the West coast. However, if you send them 10,000 units, their algorithm is going to go to work and it's probably going to split that up. And it's probably going to put some East coast, West coast, Midwest, maybe in Texas or something like that, so that you can bring those shipping times down to those greater catchments and greater regions for, for your sales. And presumably, once you have a track record of sales, not only does Amazon have amazing data across all the other competitors and complementary and substitute products that you are selling, but they will have much better data on your specific product at your specific price point and your specific brand. So they will have a better ability to spread around that inventory based on your sales data and the rest of the sales data for the category, it will just get better and better over time without you having to do a thing except making sure that FBA never runs out of your product, basically. Right. Yeah. Out of stock is a really big thing. You never want to run, run out of stock with Amazon, which is difficult if you're not, if you don't have a staging warehouse in the States where you're cold, holding excess inventory and also making sure that you have enough inventory at Amazon. But you are absolutely correct. And I will, I'll give you another anecdotal story. So we have traditionally, because we do have a staging warehouse in the US, and we also do have some FBM additional 3PL warehouses that we work with for backup shipping in case we run out at Amazon. So we don't run out of stock completely, even if we run out an FBA. And so as a result of that, because storage is fairly pricey at Amazon, more so than at most 3PLs and certainly more so than a staging warehouse, we have kept more of our inventory at that staging warehouse and shipped in lesser inventory to Amazon and make smaller shipments in. Once we realized that this geo ranking thing was a thing, we then made a conscious decision to start sending in more inventory, significantly more inventory. And almost immediately, we saw our sales bump as a result. Now, I don't have good visibility in terms of all zip codes, exactly where we're selling more and where we're not, because it's so difficult to manage that. But anecdotally, we did start selling more product. And the only thing we changed was that we were shipping in more product. So I would say that to me, it seems absolutely true, not only based on that anecdotal evidence, but also just on my understanding of how this functions, that the more inventory you give Amazon, the better they are going to be at distributing it well between the various zip codes where your product would sell. And as you indicate, Amazon's not stupid. As they begin to recognize from their data where your product is selling best, that is where they're going to send the inventory. But if you don't give them enough, they're only going to be able to distribute it so far. And did Amazon tell you in the, in the beginning when you didn't have a sales history and you were just at the start of building your brand, did Amazon give you the directive, hey, we want you to send this first shipment to this warehouse, maybe it's the Midwest or wherever it is, or did you just say, I'm going to pick this destination where it's going to go because it's closest, uh, it's the cheapest for me to ship it there versus other options across yeah. the FBA network? They pretty much dictate where you're going to ship it. You don't really have a whole lot of control over that unless you want to really pay to play. And so you're pretty much going to ship it where they tell you to. The assumption is, and they don't tell, they don't say this. And I don't know. It's interesting because anecdotally, I would say it sometimes doesn't seem like this is true, but at the same time, you don't know exactly how they're going to distribute the inventory when you send it in. But when they tell you where to send it, I would say 
it would be easy for you to look at that and say, that makes no sense. Like, why are you sending the inventory there? Clearly they have a reason. I don't always know what it is because sometimes it really doesn't make any sense. But I would say this much, data can get corrupted, let's say. And, and it's difficult for them to unwind that, I think. Just like any system, if the data is corrupted, then now it's corrupted. And it can take a while for the system to really relearn what it has incorrectly learned. And so sometimes they are sending your product to the wrong places, or they're not sending the product, let's say, to better places. And so that's one of those things with this geo-ranking thing is that, again, and I'm not going to take credit for this. Eddie Wheeler is, is the gentleman who actually introduced me to this. In fact, actually, there was somebody else who introduced me to him. But he and a partner, who apparently is his technical guy that's designing this new software they're going to release, is working on this geo-ranking thing. And so I've learned a lot from them. But one of the things that you can actually do to manipulate, let's say, where Amazon sends your product, and manipulate's a bad word because really all it is, educate is really what it is. What you can do is you can, through many platforms, advertising platforms, you can geo-target your ads. So you can specify what zip codes you want to advertise to. So if you know there's a zip code where you should be selling well, then what you need to do is blitz that zip code with advertising to send as much traffic and as many sales as possible to Amazon from that zip code. Amazon knows where those customers are from because they got to ship the product, right? So if you get a bunch of sales from 90210 and you weren't getting any before, mainly because Amazon didn't have inventory there, most likely, but all of a sudden now they're getting a bunch of orders from there. What do you think they're going to do when you send them more inventory? they're gonna ship it to the closest place they can get to 90210. So if there's zip codes that you know you should be getting sales that you're not, blitz those areas with geo-targeting and send that traffic to Amazon to, to boost your sales there. I guarantee you, they will ship your inventory there. They're not stupid. This is such great, this is such great learning, such great knowledge. This makes absolute sense. It just, as soon as you said it, like the light bulb went on and it's out, oh, geez, of course this makes sense. And obviously when you're selling pool products, if okay, in Southern California and in Florida, I should be absolutely killing it. This should be where a huge percentage of, a, or Southern Texas, or any place that it gets hotter than hell, especially in summertime, and lots of people have swimming pools per capita, then you should be absolutely crushing it in those regions. And if for some reason you're not, and it just seems out of whack, and it seems abnormal, then by doing some targeted advertising in those regions to boost up the sales behind the scenes, because Amazon is real smart. But maybe they're not smart enough to realize, oh, hey, this was juiced. The sales in this region were juiced are artificially by running a bunch of ads against that region. Oh, no, actually, all we're looking right. at is where do we need to distribute these products? And frankly, they probably don't care whether it was organic sales care. or they paid care. sales. They're, they, they're, they're going to supply them. Yep. We need it to be there because they're trying to keep their fulfillment costs as low as possible. So if they put the inventory closest mm -hmm. to the customer that's likely to buy your products, it, it means that they make more profit. Absolutely. Makes sense. And you have you said right at the top of this conversation, you have a very small catalog. It, just the top of the list, the top, off the top of my head, it looks like you've got maybe 10 SKUs in total, but then you mix and match them and you put them into bundles and they become almost like a bomb, like a bill of materials, and that becomes its own unique SKU that then you fulfill in bulk, right? So you've got, by all intents and purposes, you've got a very small catalog. Now, that's amazing because what it means is you can create more what we would call synthetic SKUs or aggregate SKUs or whatever you want to call them, virtual SKUs, whatever you want to call them, to give yourself more listings based on a series of base products that you combine in different ways to create effectively a bundle, right? Now, that's amazing because it means right. that your stock holding of individual SKUs, you, you can hold more inventory of individual SKUs, but it allows you to dramatically increase the size of your catalog without needing to carry genuine individual more SKUs, right? Also, to a degree... Based on what you said right at the start, which is, hey, look, we're looking at adding some new products, maybe even playing in some new categories that are maybe tangential or adjacent to our existing categories. If you want to grow your business, then it feels like you, you have to do some genuine catalog expansion as opposed to almost artificial catalog expansion if you want to have greater breadth or depth in your sales, right? If you want to overall increase the overall revenue, there's a threshold you're going to hit in terms of representation and saturation with your existing catalog that to grow beyond that is going to be difficult without adding to your real catalog. Yeah. I think if you're not launching products on Amazon, especially now, if you're not launching new products regularly, you're already losing the battle because there's, as you said, there's only so far you can take it. Yes, there's always more customers to a degree, but, but at the same time, categories get 
saturated. It, it becomes a scenario where, yes, you could make more sales in that category, but the amount of effort and money that it would take to increase the number of sales that you're getting on that product far displaces the amount of sales that you could generate from a new product launch in a category that's less saturated with another good product. And you get then the benefit of all of the cross-sale opportunities between the products you already have and the new product and vice versa. So you're missing out on those cross-sales without that ad additional skew and, and inventory. And anecdotally, again, Amazon has never said this to my knowledge, but anecdotally, I also understand that the brands that are routinely introducing new high-performing products in new categories, and they're expanding effectively their cross-section of reach within the Amazon ecosystem, that is a ranking factor. That is, that, that may not be a huge ranking factor, whereas the distance and the time and the cost are probably the biggest ranking factors. But certainly, if you are increasing the level of business that you are doing with Amazon overall, Amazon wants to incentivize that. So they're trying to, to encourage the brands that are maybe single product brands on Amazon, et cetera. They're looking for them to expand, especially if they're outstanding performers and they get outstanding feedback and they never have customer complaints, et cetera. Why wouldn't they want to VIG those brands to do more business through Amazon, right? Yeah, uh, it makes perfect sense that would be true. Whether it absolutely is true from a direct perspective, I don't know. But I would say this, that even if it's only happening, what's the best way to put it? At a minimum, it's happening as a secondary result of the way that their algorithm works. Because a lot of it is flywheel. It really feeds on itself. And so let's go back to that idea. If you are regularly introducing new products and you're launching them properly and doing it well, then you're generating more cross-sale opportunities. If you're using the platform properly, new product launches should increase the sales of all of the other products in your line if you're cross-promoting, like absolutely beyond a doubt. And that's, to be honest, that's one of the areas where we struggle the most because uh, I've generally run with a pretty small team and our processes haven't always been the best. And so from that stand, that's actually another initiative of, of ours this year. But that I think has been the biggest drawback for us. It's actually the thing that's held us back the most. I believe we would easily be selling three times what we're selling right now if we had been doing that all along and we had those processes really in line to be launching regularly. But if you think about that, if you're releasing new products and you're getting those cross-sale opportunities and so you're stimulating more sales there, sales volume and sales tra volume trajectory is a ranking factor for Amazon. Absolutely. So even if it's not a direct thing where Amazon's looking at that and say, hey, the, this brand's a real go-getter. They're super dedicated to their customers. They got great reviews. We want to promote them. It is absolutely a factor on a secondary level that if you're doing those things, you're just simply spinning the flywheel. So it's going to work. But if, if you look at Amazon, the interesting thing is, is that because their algorithm is based on sales, right? Google's ranking algorithm is based on relevancy primarily. Amazon is sales. Ultimately, so relevancy plays a key because you want to be relevant if you're going to make sales. But ultimately, what they want to know is how much money are we going to make on this number of people who enter the store, uh, enter the marketplace today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Right. All of that is connected to how much inventory does somebody have in stock? Are they going to sell out? What is their click through rate? If we show them, are they likely to get the click? What's their conversion rate? If somebody gets to the page, are they actually going to buy? What is the price of the product? Because, okay, that's great if this product has a better CTR and CVR, but the price point is half what this other product is. Amazon makes less money because mm -hmm. there's a referral fee of 15%. 15% of 50 bucks is a whole lot more than 15% of 25. Their FBA fee is potentially going to be higher for shipping because if this product's a little bigger than the other product and they're going to pay more in FBA, Amazon makes more money. Their advertising fees are potentially going to be more for the higher price product because that product's going to be willing to pay more for advertising. So it's, there are a lot of factors that flywheel there, but let's just look at top down. If I change the main title on my listing for Amazon, not only does it have a chance to improve my CTR because that's what shows up in the search listing, but it also potentially improves my CVR because if the title is very targeted to the product and it's got a good hook, and it tells people what the main USP is versus every other product in the category, that should spike my conversion rate also, 
which means what? My, if my CTR and my CBR go up, then my sales volume goes up and my trajectory is improving. So for Amazon, they, they pay attention to the CTR, the CBR, the sales volume trajectory, and then all of the other things they're looking at. If all of those factors go up and they all change just because I changed the title, now also as my sales volume goes up, they rank me better because all those things are better and they're making more money. Now I rank higher, so now I get more sessions, so now I get more sales. So it's just this ever spinning flywheel on Amazon. So it's, if you know how to work their algorithm, you can really generate a lot of sales on the platform if you're paying attention to all those little things that you need to be paying attention to. Absolutely love it. And as we come down to the end of our time together, and I, I just so appreciate your time, Michael, you're, you've obviously built a, a very thriving business uh, on the Amazon channel. And that is hard fought over a decade of doing this. This is hard fought learning. This is hard fought knowledge. This is hard fought experience. And I really appreciate you sharing it with me and my audience. Now, when we start thinking about tech stack, right? A lot of brands will need, when they're small, they can run most things out of spreadsheets. They can, they can have their manufacturer ship directly to FBA and they'll just give them the address and they'll send it there. And then they'll maybe get a pro forma invoice from the manufacturer and then they'll pay that. And it can all be pretty manual, right? But a lot of brands, once they reach scale or hyperscale, they need to bring automation, right? They need inventory management. They need warehouse management. They need order management. They possibly need an ERP. They, you know, they start needing things, other parts of the stack. They need an analytics layer for Amazon that they can plug into their Amazon sales so they can start tracking some of these metrics in a deeper, better way that, you know, Amazon analytics are pretty good, but as I understand it, they're a little bit difficult. They're a little bit opaque. They're a little bit, you know, they're not maybe as user-friendly as some of these third-party analytics platforms for Amazon that you can plug into your account and then you can have everything in really pretty dashboards and graphs and pie charts and everything else that make give you more actionable insights, I would say. Amazon's going to give you the raw data, but these other platforms can give you more actionable insights and data like you were alluding to and referring to in terms of momentum and SKU performance, et cetera. And what does your what did your tech stack, for lack of a better term, look like in the beginning? And what does it look like today if you're willing to share kind of the growth in that aspect of things too, to make you more scalable, to make you more efficient? Sure. I would say that in the beginning, it's funny because I'm not even sure, I'm not even sure how much how helpful it is to say what my tech stack looked like in the beginning, because the the reality is that most everything that I used in the beginning doesn't even exist anymore besides Google Sheets and things like that, which of course are gonna be around forever. They're infinite. But most of the tools that existed then don't even exist now. But I would say that one thing that I think actually, now of course, if you're an absolute brand new newbie, then ultimately use the Amazon data, utilize Google Sheets and things like that because they are effective and it's very powerful, especially now with ChatGPT and the ability to utilize Chat. If you're not an expert with Google Sheets, one of the beautiful things about ChatGPT is the ability to use that to help you create very complex Google Sheets that do a lot. Even if you have no idea what each of the individual formulas do, like you basically just tell ChatGPT, this is the data that I'm bringing in. This is what it looks like. How do I do this? How do I manipulate it this way? What formula would I use to put in this cell to do X, Y, Z, right? Yes, it'll take you a little longer than somebody who knows what they're doing, but it's free. You can do that yourself. You can build out a pretty complex spreadsheet that does a lot now that you wouldn't have been able to do three years ago. So I would say that, number one, definitely learn how to use ChatGPT and learn how to prompt it. If, if you don't know how to prompt on GPT, then you're dead in the water and you're losing a lot of ground against everybody else because we use it for listings in terms of optimization and keyword. We use it in terms of marketing and like, writing blurbs. It's not very often that I'm going to take exactly what ChatGPT gave me and, and just run with it. But what's nice about ChatGPT is that it gives you a starting point. I wouldn't call ChatGPT creative. I don't like that term, but it has so much data. Like it's going to spit out things that you wouldn't have thought of, like product development. Like ChatGPT is amazing for product development. The number of ideas that it comes up with in terms of new features and different materials that you could use and how you could design it and how you can manufacture it and all those things. It's amazing. So do not lose sight of just how much benefit you have at your disposal there for essentially free. And even if you want the upgrade, it's what, 20 bucks a month. So that's a, a major part of our tech stack, honestly, right now. Beyond that, tools like Helium 10 actually work very well. There are some actually very good all around tools that if you're a fairly new seller, 
aren't that terribly expensive and give you a lot of access to at least the basics of the data that you need. But I would say that once you start moving beyond that and you start moving into that space of maybe you're selling half a million a year or something like that, and you start moving up in that area, you should be looking at the opportunity to start creating some of your own KPI dashboards and using data piping to pipe that data into a data warehouse and then using your own dashboard so that you can decide what are the KPIs that we want to focus on for product development, for product ranking, for all of these different areas, for inventory and, and things of that nature? And just what is that? What are those two kind of North Star KPIs that if we're hitting those and we're hitting our goals, that we know the trajectory is to the moon? If you're paying attention to those, you don't need all of the data. Yeah, it can be useful. And there's a lot of tech geeks out there that are going to get really down in the weeds on it. But if you could just track those couple of KPIs per category within your business, I think you're in good shape. And it's actually not that expensive these days to, to build out some dashboards with that information. Love it. Absolutely love it. Now, as we come down to the end of our time together, I always like to flip the script and turn the microphone over to my guests. Let them ask me one question. Any question they like can be personal or professional. So Michael Kaufman from ProTuff Products, what is your question for me today? You know what my question is? So I recognize that uh, it appears you have a lot of experience in uh, e-commerce, D2C, B2B. But my question is, I wasn't able to find it. Maybe I'm just not researching it well enough. What did you, what exactly was it that you did previously? What did you sell? What type of business were you at? What's, what is that background experience that you have? Yeah. So I've been in the industry for 23, more than just more than slightly more than 23 years now. And my very first e-commerce business that I ran with my business partner was called flashcards.co.nz and it was in New Zealand. And we were the first direct importers that I'm aware of anyway, that brought, started bringing memory cards into New Zealand and selling them direct to the consumer. So we were warehousing it ourselves. There were distributors of memory cards in New Zealand at the time, but that was at a time when a 32 megabyte memory card was 650 bucks, not gigabyte, megabyte. And so we, the pricing was so insane in the beginning that we said there has to be a better way. And my business partner had been in sourcing for many years, electronics uh, sourcing. So he tapped into some of his networks to get the sourcing right from overseas. I was handling all of the digital, all of the e-commerce, all of the digital marketing, all the Google ads, et cetera. And we made a great team. And then I went and I hired a developer for us, um, a freelance developer that built all of our solutions for us and all of our integrations with, with uh, New Zealand Post for fulfillment and logistics and all that sort of stuff and automatically notifying with tracking numbers and all that sort of stuff because there was nothing automated back then. We had to build it all, our, all ourselves. And it was that early in the game. That gave us a real advantage over the local guys. And we were selling anywhere from 25 to 50% less expensive than the wholesalers were selling product for in New Zealand. And so we were undercutting the market massively and making incredible margins. And that's where we, that's where we got our start. And we, we were packing orders ourselves, me and my business partner. We were packing a couple hundred orders, 300, 400 orders a day. We were packing them all ourselves. And it was an amazing business because the products themselves are very small and very light. So you can get, you know, in a decent size carton with air freight, you can get a thousand memory cards in one shipment that costs you next to nothing to import them. And, you know, that was, we learned that one of the things if you want to start up a successful e-commerce business, make sure that the logistics side is relatively easy for you to manage, at least as a start. Before you get into the more complex products, the heavier products, the, the products that are, when we look at cubic weight, when they have massive cubic weight associated with them, maybe they're light, but they're large, that, gets, that starts to get more expensive and it gets more complex to freight them out without damaging it, et cetera, et cetera. So that would be my one piece of advice is if somebody's starting out brand new in e-commerce today, pick a product that logistically is easy to deliver and fulfill because that is gonna, that is gonna make your life a hell of a lot easier because in e-commerce, it's mostly logistics with a fancy front end slapped on the front of it. it. It's mostly a logistics game. And if you can't, if basically you cannot be competitive because of the logistical nightmare associated with your products, you'll never make money and, and it will be frustrating and it will be hyper competitive. That would be, that, that's how I got my start. And I tell you, we ran that for, for seven years and the learnings that came out of that was insane. I was actually working for an agency very briefly before that. And that's how I started out in e-commerce. But within, within sort of six months of working for the agency, I thought, man, 
I'm helping these businesses to grow their business. And I was helping them run marketing and I was helping them. This was in the very, very early days of e-commerce. So we were all trying to figure it out together. And I was helping them build their business. I was helping them get back, back backlinks into their website to get better Google rankings organically. We were running Google ads for them, et cetera. And I just thought, man, this is so dumb. I'm helping these business absolutely crush it and make so much money. Why don't, and, and my business partner was thinking the same thing. He was looking at the market going, I'm not an e-commerce expert. You're the e-com guy, but I see the market and it looks like a really good opportunity. Why don't we give this thing a go? And luckily he had yeah. quite a bit of money to, to back us and bootstrap us from the beginning. And he, we never took on outside investment. And within a couple of years, we're doing close to a million dollars in revenue a year. And I tell you, that was at the time, with the price the products were, that was a lot of money. And Google ads were five cents a click. And I tell you, I would love to be oh, back. I, I would love to be. I would I love it. to be <laughs> back in those days. I would love to be back in those days. Yeah, yeah, it was crazy. Penny a click. That was insane back then. It certainly was. Listen, Michael, it's been absolutely my pleasure speaking with you today. I appreciate you sharing the knowledge with my audience. Now, I will put in the show notes, I'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile, I'll put a link to your Amazon store for ProTuff products so people can go and check you out. But if people want to get a hold of you and, and reach out and have a chat to you about your products or about e-commerce and Amazon, et cetera, how do you prefer people get a hold of you? Yeah, sure. Certainly, certainly LinkedIn or through through ProTuff through our website is fine. But also, actually, myself and a couple of other other gentlemen are uh, actually launching a podcast and, and a mentoring program at Brand Fortress HQ and Brand Fortress HQ podcast. So brandfortresshq.com. And so you could certainly connect with us there. We've got some free information available there and you can email us, fill out the form, maybe look for some mentoring, whatever. Amazing. Michael, it's been an absolute pleasure and I can't wait to speak, you, speak to you again soon. I really thank you for your time. If you'd like to get mentored by Jason for free, head over to greenwoodconsulting.net, scroll to the bottom of the page and click Get Mentored by Jason.